It's right. So I get some potatoes on the board. All right. Now, so Sarah Frazetta is my first guest on my first podcast. And I'm so excited about that because she's wonderful. I've just met Sarah for the first time and she's wonderful. And so if you've got any questions for Sarah, please ask them in the comments. Like I say, we're a minute behind, but I can already see there are some my students and there's there's Jorge Farfa. Hi, Jorge. I haven't seen Jorge for ages. And there's Christopher, uh, James Christopher Hill. I met him at DragonCon 2014. Another uh, beautiful human being. You know I love him? him. Yeah. Yes, what a sweet man he is. Wonder. Love him. And there's Bob. All right, now, we are here today to celebrate a, an amazing book that's just coming on. Now, the first book I ever got from Frank Rosetta was this Ballantine one here. I saw Frank after I saw Boris Vallejo. So the first uh, introduction to fantasy art for me was definitely way back. And I did see Frank's work, but I was such a kid, I didn't know it was Frank. I saw the Warren covers as a kid. I just didn't know the magic was created by a person for some strange reason. I did know the pencil drawings were and ink drawings because my, I could do those. So to me, it was, it was just magic, the covers of the books. And then I saw, um, the Savage Sword of Conan number four with Frank, with Boris Vallejo's cover. And inside it said cover by Boris Vallejo. That's when I realized you could make art uh, as a living. And I was working with my dad on a building site. Uh, that's how it was back then. You didn't go to, you didn't go to university. You went to the building site at 15. Yeah, that's a <laughs> <laughs> different world, different world. Yeah. And I, I was out the back window, it was summer holidays. I went back to school, but I was in the back window like this, looking at all my mates playing football as I was taken away for 14 hours a day to work on this site. But I had money and I walked into a bookstore. Yeah. It was actually a news agent, strangely. And there was the fast, fantastic art of Frank Frazetta right there. And there was only one copy. And I needed oxygen. I was so excited. I needed oxygen. Any, it would have been a Black Friday sale scenario if someone tried to pick that up before me. That's how <laughs> determined I was to get that book. And I ran across the store and I picked it up and I went, this is magic. And I paid my money for it and I walked out and I looked at that book a million times. Um, is it, I probably studied Frank's art longer than he painted it. So that Egyptian queen, for instance, I probably looked over that longer than he painted it, for sure. So what's happening now is that Sarah and Tatian have come out with what looks like, I, I can, once again, I need oxygen. I ordered it at Christmas, because I'm in Australia, I ordered, ordered it at Christmas, and I thought it'll be here in time for the podcast. It's not coming till March. That's me. I've got my yeah. American, American friends have all got it. Uh, I haven't gotten it to make you feel better. I have not gotten it. my kind of copies yet. I'm like, I, I'll, I'll probably be the last one. So maybe mine will be, I don't want to jinx it, but it might be after March. So <laughs> get on. Okay, well, let's have, I a, know. let's have a look at some unboxing of it. Uh, I don't want to spoil oh. the, the whole mystery. What do you think, Sarah? Should we have a look, a quick look at it? I, I say let's build up the excitement because I, I think yeah. there's many people that still have not got their copy yet. And it's, you know, it's, crazy I but that, I love that Patrick that you were working that you know had that work ethic instilled in you and I mean I I definitely think that foundation right it, it paid off in the end I mean we'll look what yeah. you've accomplished and and built in terms of of teaching and your all of your accolades I mean it's really quite incredible so I think more more people need to be working those 14 hour days <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you it really made the weekends feel special it really did I mean, oh yeah when you have when you have, you're kind of literally caged in you yeah. you have you have a more uh, a zest for the free time and and that's a lot of the times when when people will say to me isn't it great we're having your own business and working for yourself and it's like yes to a point but sometimes you have to be the person that instills that discipline in yourself and you don't have a schedule and then you can end up doing nothing. So it's, it, it's, it's definitely a balancing act. And I think that's a lot of artists would probably feel that way. They're like, Oh, you know, I have to, I have to be the, the boss of myself. And that can be difficult at times. Yeah. The boss, that's a good point. The boss of yourself. That's a really great phrase. Yeah. That is one of the hardest things isn't it, Sarah? Cause you've got this whole enterprise working and you are the boss of it and yourself, aren't you? And that's, that takes a lot of discipline. So here it is. I wish this was me. I wish this was me. I don't have that ma masculine hairy hand. I've got no hair on my arms at all. 
I don't know what's going on there. But Luke, well, I have the opposite of the problem. I'm a Sicilian, so I've got I've got some <laughs> more than I'd like. <laughs> it all falls off anyway. I'm less hairy. It, it does. It does. I, I'm like as I'm getting older now. With my hair problem is disappearing. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that either. Uh, you see those older. I went to see my uncle Dan in Ireland recently. There, he's like a plucked chicken. He's just sitting there with a shirt off. <laughs> it's like a plucked chicken. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's still hair, that's <laughs> gonna... single hair in his body. A oh giant my infant. god. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So yeah, this so this book was was really interesting about this was um, Benedict Taschen, the owner of Taschen Publishing. He really uh, involved himself in 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 this in this process. And he was very dedicated to bringing in more of my grandfather's early works um, because they were just, as, as we see on this uh, spread right now, his inks were just incredible from oh, such an inks. early age. Yeah. And, and what he did to comics was, was, it, was it was riveting. It was, um, it was, he brought so much energy and not to say that, you know, there was Jack Kirby and other greats at the time, Al Williamson, yeah. but he just brought such a, a life of its own by by bringing in, you know, you, you put all of your creative inspirations in a blender and then put your own little touch to it. And then that's that's the creative process. And and to see to see his energy as a uh, it's all I, I, I would I don't want to say that I appreciate his earlier work more because there's something magical in all of in all stages of his artwork. But yeah. there was definitely some kind of energy in his early work that really in, like captivates me because I see the I see the drive and the want in the artwork in the lines like to prove himself as an artist and I'm so so I'm so glad that they put that 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 focus on his early work and, and dedicated so much of the book to that which is pretty incredible it's amazing and just looking at it now I didn't want to spoil it uh, so I'm not going to look at all of it unless you want to Sarah but I'm looking at a piece I've never seen before, and that's on, uh, that's astonishing to me, because I mine yeah. the I mine everything for Frank's work. I really do, and that was another question I w wanted to ask. Can we speak about the incident, Cain uh, Cain in the Golden Sea? I should have asked you before; it was out, out of my mind. You know what I mean? Can we discuss yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, we'll, you, we'll, we'll discuss sorry. it. Later. We'll discuss <laughs> it later. And there is a slight okay. delay, so we have two two delays here. We have a delay of a minute for everyone to be, that's watching this live. They say it's 20 seconds, but it's a minute. I've checked it. And we've got a three second or four second delay between me and Sarah. So Sarah, if I see, sound like I'm turning talking over the top of you, I'm actually not. So just be everyone be aware that we're all in a time loop. We're all in a time loop here. But I, I, I can't believe that this is a piece I haven't seen and I love it. And I love Frank's, I'm going to say it right here. I don't think anybody was better than Frank Frazetta at pen and ink. Anybody, because not only I'm, the, yeah, go on, I'm, sir. I'm by bi I'm biased, but I have to agree with you. It's it's Amazing. what I saw, what I could, what how he handled an ink brush. It blows my mind. I mean, you you know, you know what it's like to handle one. I've handled yeah. one briefly, and I'm like, how did he just control this? Like it was yeah. it was almost like a, a part of his hand. Yeah. And it's it's really, really incredible. It's incredible that he, at this age, I mean, he, this was his Thunder. This was a blown up panel from Thunder. Yeah. And just to see the uh, under, the, the overall understanding of, of shapes and, and interesting designs and composition and where to, what, what to leave out and, and what to, just how to use that empty space. It's, it's, it, to me, it's, it's like, yes, he, he practiced his craft, but I just believe some people come onto earth and just have a gift. Yeah. And it's, it's our responsibility then to find that gift and, and, and work at it and make it the best of, of, of what we can with it. And yeah. I, I, I definitely think that, I mean, he never had a real formal training. He was mainly self-taught. And yeah. it's just, it's really incredible. And that, again, this is why with this book, it's so important that you can see these early works and say, look, this was, this yeah. was inherent. This was just part of Frank. Yeah. He was a master anchor. It's yeah, the funny that you use that word inherent, because I, I felt that the other day as well on that exact subject, you know, like Boris had academic training and you can see it in his work. And Frank had an innate quality. I mean, it was just, just in him. It wasn't, it was a wisdom that was very few people get struck with this lightning bolt. And when I'm looking at just 
Just look at that line right there on that leg. The control oh, of that. I, I, right there. It's that's beautiful. It's a, a pen. It's a beautiful right? line. Yeah. And it's 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 absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful yeah. line. And that's what I loved when he wasn't exact with anatomy. Um, it, it was because he, you know, at, at this time he, he wasn't, he had still a lot of training to do um yeah. with himself, but but he always said uh, first and foremost, it was what was pleasing to the eye over, over being correct. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why he would say, if I want to go take a photograph, I will, and it will be exact. It will be an exact replicate replication yeah. of what nature is, what God is. But when I paint, I want to make, I want to bend it. I want to make it interesting. And I will do that with every line, with every paint brush stroke, and yeah, you can see that it's like, the, and that I love that you that you're because you're you're a master yourself, and you can pull out these these little intricacies and and appreciate them on such a unique level. Well, I thank you, Sarah. Well, we're going to look at it in my notion. Yeah. All right. So there's the book. We'll probably we'll probably come back to that. Sorry, Sarah. Once again, it's the it's the um, it's the satellite. Now, when I. I'm, this is my first podcast, so I realized when I was showing a full screen um, there that we couldn't see the comments. We couldn't see them at all. Uh, so next time we do a full screen there, maybe hold off the comments, uh, but I'll have a check here. <laughs> and there's Christopher saying thank you to, to you, Sarah. And Marv, oh. I don't have words, best life, thanks. All right. Or us another awesome artist. All right, Bob asked... Um, how old was your father when he started drawing? I think that was a Bob question. Your grandfather? So he started drawing when he was two. I mean, that's when he we, he started drawing as soon as he could handle a pencil or a crayon or whatever he was using, probably a crayon at two. Yeah. Um, but he started he sold his first piece of artwork to his grandma for a penny. And it was really his grandma who encouraged him to to keep at it with art. I mean, his, his he grew up in the Great Depression. And his parents were busy, to say the least. They were trying to, you know, just keep the house afloat. And his father was trying to make a, a, an honest income. And it was, it was tough. So they didn't have the luxury of being able to encourage their son and say, oh, you're going to be great. It was, it was a more logical approach where his father was like, well, you better have a backup plan. I mean, even telling him as a five-year-old boy, I don't think, I don't think art's the, the right lane for you. Um, but it was really because of my grandfather's um, grandmother who just was, she was there. She was very like, you know, at that stage of her life where she could be very attentive. She didn't have a lot going on and she just continually encouraged him to keep going. And, and it was actually his teachers who, who approached um, his parents and said, this boy is very gifted. He's drawing all over chalkboards. He's drawing in his notebooks. He's not really paying attention in school. Um, and he's just drawing, drawing, drawing. So please put him in art school, at least on the weekends. And, and that's what prompted him to, to go into the Brooklyn Academy of Fine Arts with Michelle Falanja, who was a, a, a trained artist from, from, I believe he was from Sicily. And he was, he was um, actually a very, very well-known artist at the time. And he was in, in local art shows. And he took my grandfather under his wing and and just introduced him to the to the old masters and kind of got his foundation started there. Amazing, but yeah. So did, but did, did Frank ever see your work? Oh, Frank! No, I yeah. said with I said with Ellie, and to be honest, I was hoping Frank would come in. You know, and I talked with Ellie for ages. I talked with her for ages. We sat down and she looked at my digital portfolio. Now at the time I was working digitally because the whole world had changed the way it always does yeah. and it looked like yeah. nobody was buying um traditional work anymore and so mm -hmm. i was showing her all the stuff and she was knocked out by it. it was great and then she says to me so how did you paint these what paints did you use and i was embarrassed i said it's digital and she says oh and then she because she's quite candid right and like i was oh, saying oh, yes to sarah earlier i've got four Irish sisters so i know what candid is and she mm -hmm. um she says but you'll never have this and I, my heart broke until, and I realized she's absolutely right. I will never have this original artworks. And it changed my whole wow. life. I went back, wow. went, I don't care about whether I need to do digital or not. I'm going to go back to traditional work. And I went and started painting some pictures and then saw that there was a, it's almost like a thunderbolt. The worlds collided and, and a show came up in America in Pennsylvania. And I went there. And I exhibited with Boris 
Michael Whelan, all the greats, except for Frank. And they were all there. Uh, and Frank was not well at the time. And so mm -hmm. we were going to go and see Frank. There was, we had worked it out at that convention with all these great artists that were in one place. The uh, curator, Pat Wilshire, said, we're going to put a bus on and we're all going to go, like kids, we're all going to go and meet Frank. It's all been arranged. And when he told me it on screen, I screamed like a little schoolgirl. I went, oh. <laughs> like that, I, can't I jumped out of my chair because we were like this. And I saw him flag me. I saw him go, I don't think we could take you. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to you're gonna, you're gonna annoy Frank, aren't you? So, but unfortunately, Frank, you know, he passed away before we, we actually had that trip. I never, I never got to meet him. But he was all That's, set. Oh. Yeah, he was all set to meet I'm us. I'm sorry. Oh, it would have been wonderful. It would have been wonderful. Now, we've also got... I, I think yeah. he would have loved, to answer the question, I think he would have loved your artwork. It's so, it's, it's, you just have all of the points that he talked about. It's like the understanding of the light, the, uh, the beautiful anatomy. Your women are gorgeous. So that's like, I mean, that's, a, it seems like, and again, I don't like comparison, comparing artists either. I think everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, but I do have to say like, your women are exceptionally beautiful. And I know he would have been absolutely uh, thrilled by that. And, and then your, your, of course, your, your understanding of anatomy, it's like, it's, it's, it's so it's, you can see how much work you've put into really understanding every single body part. I mean, it from your, from the way that you, you teach and it's just, it's, it's incredible. The movement, the way that I, like, I'm looking at that piece right now and like seeing the spine and, and the rib cage. And like, I just, I, I love the, 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 the placement of lighting and how you chose to accentuate some parts like that. And it's, it's not, it not it's not expected. Um, also the, with the way that you design shapes and it's, and I, like I said, before we started this, like you have a, such an interesting palette. It's um, incredibly to me, very moody and moving and, Every time I've seen, I've seen your art for a long time now. And, um, you know, n me personally not knowing much about art, I can just say I, I'm, I'm more of an auditory person. I'm very, very deeply moved by sound, my music composition, but um, and it kind of takes more for me to get moved by, by visual arts. And with your art, you've always deeply moved me. So I think just having this, this, um, this emotion in your artwork he would have loved you to death for that. So there's my my long answer. Thanks, Sarah. That's a wonderful thing to hear. And I'm hearing it from Frazetta. I am hearing this from <laughs> Frazetta. So I'm sort of really excited about it. Every time I think that you're Sarah Frazetta, I get excited. I've got to calm down. I'm like that scream in the, you, you've been flagged. I'm, like a scream <laughs> when I heard I'm not, like, I'm not going to flag you. I, I like that. It's, I, like, I love your enthusiasm. You're fun. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Now I want to ask you: Do you so do you use um, live models for your pieces, or how I do, do you? Okay, do. that's beautiful. I do, and so, but what I do is, and here's another example here, is I riff off of the anatomy. So look at, here at uh, we can't say Conan. Let's look at this barbarian, right? Here's a barbarian, and you can see that I've riffed off of these abdominal mu muscles because I want to feel that uh, energy that you can't get from copying a photograph. But sometimes I'll go into academia, I'll go in and I'll make that female figure really fleshy, even to the point where we start to see some, some marks on the flesh as well. But all this stuff here, you know, that harder edge on the elbow, running down this long head of the tricep and disappearing onto here. There's a lot of muddiness in there and that's all Frank. All of that is Frank. All of this flow is Frank. And Frank, in fact, there's Frank Frazetta hair right there. So I'm, I'm learning from what just studying his work. I'm, I'm studying the scars, you know, that like we say, and basically let's just say there, there's the, I, there's the that's the Frank Frazetta Coney, you know? And I see such an, I see such an influence, but like you have such a, again, like Patrick J. Jones has such a distinct style as well that again, like you, you did it perfectly where you took your influence, the influence like Boris Vallejo and Frazetta and then made it your own. And I, I, I love how, like you in particular, your, your armor and, and the clothes that they're wearing, and, you know, the clothes that lack, or lack of, but, <laughs> but, but, the, but the armor, I mean, it's just beautiful the way you shine the light on it. And 
I mean, if you want to go back to um, the one with the, I want to say the, the girls surrounding and trying to bring down the barbarian. Vanquished. Um, yeah, this is this. So what year did you paint this? This is, let me have a look at the date down there. This was for, um, this was for Pat Wilshire, the curator of that show. And the date is, is it 13? Yeah, it's 2013, okay. I think. Okay. It's, it's funny because I, I, I don't, it's, I, sometimes I feel like art and, and life, you know, they, they cross over in like the strangest ways. There's a lot of girls that my grandfather painted their faces and I'm sure he was inspired by, you know, mag different magazines and, and the girls that he had seen on, on TV and wherever else he found his inspiration in real life. Um, but I see them like girls, you know, there's a, a, a a plethora of Instagram girls now, Instagram models. So we we're, we're always visually stimulated. And there is a girl that we've actually worked with a few times in modeling. And I always say she looks like a Frazetta girl and oh, yeah. um, all the way to the, to the left there, it looks like her, but this is predating her being popular on the internet or anything. Her name, her name is Jordan Johnson. She's a model. And that, that girl on the left looks like a lot like her. So I, I sometimes I think artists, you guys don't even know what you're doing. You're like, man, you're like, you know, creating, you, you know what the next beauty is going to be, the standard of beauty, and and, yeah. and, and there it is, you, you formulate it. So it, this piece, like, like I said before, the the way that the expression, that you, how you capture them, they all have a different personality. They all are fierce, but yet they're all you, individuals. And I just feel like that's one of, probably one of the hardest things to do. So I know this is your podcast and I'm not supposed to be interviewing you, but I want to ask you, do, do. Do, do, you what, do you do you think of like, do you think of the story, like the moments before, the moments after, like how do you develop your storytelling with, with, and, and as far as like the, developing these characters in your paintings? Well, I'll take you, I'll take you in and have a look at it. We can start from there. Let's have, okay. here's, here's the first germ. This was for, remember, I, I was at Dragon Con in 2014, and they wanted mm -hmm. me to paint a picture uh, to be a poster for that time. And so the first thing I do is this. I just sit down with a pencil, just like Frank did, just sit with a pencil and with no reference at all, and just think about what could this, what could this become? And I love that. I love the idea still that there was nothing 10 minutes ago, and now there's something, and a ball has started rolling. And now there's going to be something really big coming from this. And so then I send them a color rough like this. I don't illustrate anymore, by the way. I just did this because I wanted to go to that convention because they honored me with, with that idea. So I often do lots, lots of little color roughs. And some of them become other paintings. There's another one there. And this one became a painting here. So that's what I do. I do this. And I saw Ryan in the comments there. Ryan just commissioned me recently there. Ryan, I varnished the painting yesterday. He's so patient. He is so patient. He's been waiting for this painting forever. And what a great man uh, for doing this. So just a call out there uh, to Ryan Metzger. He's a great, a great collector and a great, a great guy. So yeah, I do this, Sarah. So I write this. If it's too abstract for the collector to look at, I write on in the margins here. Princess emerging mm -hmm. from the cloak, uh, bathed in light, uh, broken chains on legs, just tiny, simple things. It, never, it may not become anything. It may not become anything at all there's just quickly there's boris look at him boris. lovely man lovely man he, uh, yes. did the, he did the forward for my book and that's the picture right there i was and, gonna say are you typically like doing right 38 uh i'm sorry i'm when the not the, the my are my terms of measurement over here in the u.s but like 38 inches by 46 inches yeah they're, they're, they're generally okay. with that 36 by 48 yeah i think it's 36 by 48 okay. and they go up exponentially to 72 and stuff. Uh, wow. so, yeah, so there's there's big paintings there because I like painting big. And luckily I do because I get my look at these glasses. Somebody said to me, Sarah, you're ready for this. I went to teach oh, a light I'm ready. I went to teach, teach a light draw class. And, and this guy said to me, I put glasses on, right? And this guy said to me, You're so brave that you come here and you're visually impaired. I teach a class like I'm a war hero. It's just a pair of glasses. I'm so, I'm so brave. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. So dramatic. You're so dramatic. Very, very dramatic. Oh my God. No, I think it's great that you paint at that scale. It's, it's really beautiful. I mean, 
uh, a lot of the times people are very surprised how small my grandpa's art is because it just seems so much grander and larger when, when you're yeah. looking at it in a book like that you'd expect it to be at that scale. So how long does it typically take you to do? Or is it, does it kind of depend on how inspired yeah. you're feeling or do you have a set kind of discipline or how do you how do you handle each painting? Well, time -wise? Sir, well sir, I'm a lazy bum. Okay, so that's the first disclaimer, right? I'm a lazy. You're an guy. artist. Yeah, yeah. You've just like a lot of feelings. I, just like Frank, I'd rather be out in the in the garden, reading the, reading an art book rather than painting the art. I love painting, by the way. When I start painting, I can't stop. So there's this strange procrastination thing that happens where it's hard for me to come into the studio, and then it's hard to get me out of it. But what I did, that discipline yeah. of being on the building side so young, and then becoming a commercial illustrator and painting a picture a day for for advertising agencies. Like I remember an advertising agency rang me up at nine o'clock in the morning and said, we need a, a, a billboard. They mean a billboard you see on the freeways. We need a billboard for today. It was just comic book art, but it was still pressure, right? A billboard for today. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be up in a convention in Sydney. And I said, by the end of the day, cause that would have been a call already. He says, no, by 12 o'clock. I says, wow, okay, well I can work something out of that. and. He said, so you can send us a sketch first. I said, you got to approve it within the next 20 minutes. And they, they agreed to that. So I give the sketch in 20 minutes and they approved it. And I says, okay, I'll start on that cartoon. So you need it for 12. He says, no, we need it printed by 12. So they've got a printer. Ooh. This is 9.30. Wow. This is 9.30. Wow. So when, when do you need me to have it done? They said by 10 o'clock, half an hour. And so half an hour later, I had finished this cartoon, pristine, and sent it through. And it was printed in Sydney and put up in that hall by 12 o'clock. That's the kind of pressure I was under. So I get out of that <laughs> quick smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's too much on, on the body yeah. and the mind and the spirit and all of and, it. And it I really, mean, but it, it's good too to have those moments of, of yeah. complete press. It's good. Why? Well, yeah, I had black hair back then. And the next day I didn't. But, I said, <laughs> yeah. but say this one here. But when I started moving into fine art and people would ask me that question all the time, how long does it take? And I, because I'm so sporadic, I come in, do a bit, go away, write something. You know, I've written eight mm -hmm. books. So I like to break up the time and be enthused by everything. And I thought to myself, how long does it take? And I painted this every day. And it took me uh, 12 days to do it. And so I realized that with full guns going, I'm 12, 12 days for a painting. Now, back in my advertising days, I could do a, an oil painting in a day. In fact, I did six oil paintings in one three-day bonanza, but they weren't wow. great. They were awful. And I know that Frank did three Tarzans in a weekend, and he admitted that they weren't great. So mm -hmm. that's what you get. You get, you know, you get greatness well, when you have some yeah. time to actually produce it. it. It's true. And it's like, it's, it, I, my grandpa was the, the, the same way as much as he would, you know, um, glorify, oh, I did this one overnight or three nights. It's like in reality, he was actually tinkering at some pieces for years and then you completely paint over it and it would take more years. So there, there really wasn't like a, 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 a stamped time of an average time of his art. It really just was dependent on the schedule, the, the, the deadlines and he, he too, he was a procrastinator. And I think that's just like, you know, I said, it's a, an artist, it's going on emotions. And there is, there is that feeling of, of stress when you have to come up with this, it's in there, but like coming up with this, this new design, this new concept. And, and then once you get going, you do feel like you're in the flow state, but it is like a, how I, I, I got sticky feeling like, oh no, gotta get back into this again, you know? And then it's, yeah. I don't know what that is. Why, why uh, humans do that? But <laughs> my grandpa did that. He was notorious for that. I mean, I think I'm, I'm sure you've heard the story. It's a very popular story, but with his Neanderthals, he, he waited till the, till the last night and then he pull, had to pull up the Masonite board because he didn't have any materials <laughs> and he, and he pumped that one out in like six hours and put it in the oven um and that one that one that that one he got very lucky because that one is a, I mean that was a, a masterpiece it's a, it's an, it's incredible Neanderthals um but yeah a lot most of them he was tinkering at them and still he was never fully happy with a lot of pieces there were I'd say like 20 of his oils where he was like that one I oh my god it's incredible but like for instance Sea Witch he was never happy with Sea Witch oh really he oh he was and, and 
to be honest, the final version, it wasn't his best. It was, it was too, it was too, the, the oil was caked on, um, on her body and the, he kind of lost that witch face. And, you know, that's just the risk you take, I guess, as an artist, like going back and saying, I'm going to make this better. And, and then sometimes you just, you know, you don't know, when, like we were saying before, you don't know when your last day is going to be, and you never actually have the <laughs> chance to, <laughs> or, you're, when you're, or when your right hand's going to stop working. And then he's like, oh my God, now I can't fix my paintings. That's um, you know? So when did that happen, Sarah? When did he have to start using his left hand? What, do you remember how old he was? Yeah, so he was in, I think he was 68. It was in 1996. He was born in 1928. In case anyone wants to do the math, that will not yeah. be me. Um, but he was in his Boca Grande house in Florida, and he just had a massive stroke. And he had, he had had, um, oh gosh, I think he had like eight strokes following that. And they were all kind of like more mini strokes. It was, it was terrible. It was very debilitating, but my grandpa lost everything when he had that stroke. I mean, he, he had been suffering even before then. If you notice like his style in the eighties was very different than his sixties, seventies, even yeah. his fifties work. Um, and, and not to say there wasn't beautiful pieces that were done in the eighties, but they were definitely different. And it was a different energy coming out of him. And he was going through a horrible battle with um, Graves disease. It was hyperthyroidism oh, yeah. and he was not diagnosed with that until like, I think six years after he started feeling really terribly, he dropped from a hundred and I think he was about 185 pounds to 125 in a matter of six months. And he could not keep weight on him. He could not sleep. They put him in a mental institute because what? they didn't really know. They, meaning the, the medical community, didn't understand thyroid, like what happens with your thyroid at this point. Medicine, you know, obviously advances every single day. Um, and so, so he would go to the doctors and he'd say, I feel crazy. Like, and he was like, he was, he was uh, paranoid. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He smelled things in his, like he, he was smelling phantom smells. Like, so you imagine the people around him, they're like, oh my God, like, like his kids, I was too young to remember this. And I was born in 88. So I wasn't, I must've been like one when this was happening, but he was, he was, he was losing it. He was losing his mind. And, and that, and that really affected his ability to, to draw or come up with anything. He said he, when he closed his eyes, he was so typically like he could, he could see Im images and visuals and colors and it took everything away from him. So he had just gotten, like, he just got his thyroid removed. He was doing pretty good again, like through the early nineties and then he's freaking stroke. And then, I mean, wow. I, so he, he just, the poor man, like from, from having all this it wasn't like he was a sedentary guy, you know, and he didn't have a lot of power. He had so much power. He had so much energy. He was so athletic. He was so competitive and, and, and freaking talented. And then it, everything was taken away from him um, in that period of time. So he didn't, he didn't get too, uh, too long of a time to, to fully execute his artwork. I mean, I'll, sorry for being long winded, but he, it, what, what broke my heart was he said in a couple of interviews when he was older, he said he really wanted to move into um, doing wildlife and, and oh, really? into just like, yeah. So he wanted to get into more like just like wolves and bears and capture the essence of like beautiful landscapes. And and he just unfortunately, he, his ability was taken from him before that could happen. That makes me really sad. Yeah, that is very sad. I'm sorry that happened. I really, you know, the whole world's heartbroken, too, when, when we heard that. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much it's touched everyone's lives, you know, that um, like your direct family. But I was devastated, too. I was devastated. Um, I mean, Frank passed away a day after my birthday and I was all celebrating the birthday. And then uh, then I heard that news and it was just awful. Oh. But it, I, was, it, it was sudden. It was really bad. I was yeah. I was with him when he passed away. Um, How were you? It was. Yeah, it was. It was. So not to get graphic, but I was, I, we, he had just enjoyed a, a great lunch. He was down in his, his winter home in Boca Grande and he was having lunch with his daughters. He was eating oysters. He loved oysters. So he was oh, eating too. oysters and, yeah, do you do? <laughs> and he, he loved them. He'd slurp them up and it was, it was a whole thing. It was, it was quite a, quite a um, show when he would eat oysters. So <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, grandpa, but he came home and he just, 
we went and sat on the couch. We all went upstairs for a moment and, you know, to give him his space because he had just had a lot of stimulation from all of us, like, you know, yelling at lunch and not yelling like in an angry way, but talking very loud. So we give him his space. Um, and then my sister came in and she came upstairs because there's was, there was sections to this apartment for, for visual reference. And my grandpa was on the first floor. My sister comes up to the second floor and she goes, is grandpa sleeping? And I'm like, what? And then we all rushed down and it was, it was literally in minutes. Like he just had a, a, a stroke, which caused a brain aneurysm and he was gone. Oh. And, you know, as, as, as tragic it was, it was, it was like, I, at least I, I was happy that he didn't have to, to suffer more. He had already been through so much suffering that I was like, at least it was like, that's the way he would have wanted to go was just quick. Like, take me out quick. I mean, I hope I, I hope I follow him in that way. I'm like, please, just someone yeah. quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, he had a great but, life. Yeah. He yeah. had a great life. He did. He did. He did. Yeah, he and he, you know, again, this sounds nihilistic. I keep going back to this. I'm sorry. But he just, he was ready. He was so like over yeah. it. He was like, I'm so over struggling and, and not being able to walk right. And having an oxygen tank. He was so over that quality yeah. of life. It wasn't to him, he he would have, he just wished he could go back to that, you know, youthful Frank Frazetta, the powerful Frank Frazetta. Yeah. And it really bothered him. And it was, and he was a very, he was a very handsome man. And that was very important to him. And that's also what the Graves disease did to him, which a lot of fans don't know that when they would come to the museum, uh, my grandma would say Frank's not feeling very well, but it was really because my grandfather didn't want to take pictures looking like that. He yeah. was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be remembered like this. I want to be remembered as that handsome, yeah. you know, like vibrant man that I was, that I still feel like I am. I'm just not that on the outward. And that, and that's just him being a, you know, a very critical artist of, of, of himself as how he looks yeah. visually to the world. Yeah. He was an incredibly handsome man. He could have been in movies, couldn't he? He was really very handsome. He could, he could have acted. He loved film. Like he, I mean, I, yeah. he, I think if he, I think if he wanted to leave his house, like that was the problem with my grandpa, why he like never got into baseball. And he regretted that as well, because he could have, he could have had, he could have played baseball and he could have um, been an artist as well. And because the time lined up, but he didn't want to leave Brooklyn. It just was a creature comfort thing. And he didn't, he, and he, I think he would have been definitely into, I think he was offered to work with Dino De Laurentiis on a film, but they were filming over in some, somewhere in Asia. And he was like, oh, he had never, he had never left the United States. So I was going to ask that. I was going to ask yeah. that question. Wow. Yeah, he never left. <laughs> I've never seen that picture, Patrick. Neither what have is, I. Well, wow. this is amazing, Sarah. Look at what I think this might be, and I might be wrong. Is Frank making a model for this painting? Maybe. I have, your guess is as good as mine here. I but saw. Look this. at that face. That's my grandpa right there. <laughs> is that what he is? So, look, right there, like, like a lot of a lot of his body. It, his whole body's into he, it. His whole body's into it, and he's just like you know, he he wasn't. He was articulate. He was very intelligent, but he would express himself with a lot of you know and pout like the fists yeah. and the hands like very very yeah. italian and and you could just you, this picture summarizes his personality so very yeah. well that's the, that's the that's the frank i knew right there well, yeah so we're both seeing this for the first time i don't know where it came from i thought that's it might beautiful. have been a catapult i thought it might, but there's a head in there for sure and i wondered if it was that some it could have been the um it could have been the jaguar god too uh, you know that the yeah. um oh yes that, could, yes uh, yeah. maybe that's what it is maybe that's what it, it could is. be i'm i'm not sure though that, I'm, that makes I'm that's just theorizing that, i believe that's what you got it right on on the ball there sarah because he did just make with, some, it, with the head up like that I yeah because he did make some sculptures didn't he for fire and ice he made little busts didn't he and they were they were brilliant he did yeah. He did, and this was around the time, um, I think Jag Jaguar God was later in the 80s, and then, um, so he was, yeah, he was doing a little bit of sculpting. My grandma, the the, the truth bearer, she really told him all the time, <laughs> she got she got on him and said, why aren't you sculpting? You're so good at sculpting, and he just never, lazy, he was lazy, he was, I mean, I hate saying that, I'm like, what could he produce, but his collection of of art was actually pretty small considering how long he was doing it but that's because he didn't like gardening but like you he liked to enjoy life he was he wanted yeah. to be outside and <clears throat> taking in all the inspiration and when he felt like doing art he did art 
Yeah. Or, you know, if he had to make money, he did art. But <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Incredible. Well, I'm going to just quickly look at the comments because I don't want people to think okay. that they're being misthought. Uh, Ket Mendoza asks, Sarah, you first of all, what kind of music do you listen to when you're creating? Because he caught you with the auditory person uh, and also me as well. What music do you listen to when you're you're painting? So I don't do much painting. I've done some watercolors, but drawing um, or anything creative, writing, I like to listen to a lot of soundtracks um like uh Braveheart for example uh I love the, the compositions of uh James Horner with Titanic if I put on Titanic I will cry now I can yeah. use that when <laughs> with with um with my with my drama um hobby when I when I do my acting I, I tend to listen to music to kind of get into the role or whatever I'm doing that that week um but I I so I love soundtracks but I really love all music I love anything from like 60s uh, to, you know, popular music from the 60s era. Like I love the 80s. I love, it really depends on my mo mood of the day. I'm, my grandfather had more of a peculiar taste and he didn't really branch out on, on new things. But I just think that like, I love hip, I love hip hop. I love, I love drums and, and synthesizers. So I'm, I'm just such a fan of music. Um, And if it, if it's, if it's good and it, it's kind of, I don't know if you know this, Patrick. Um, yeah. There's a song, it's called Paper Planes by MIA. And I did not know until yesterday. I was like, my life is a lie. Um, I called my mom and said that my life is a lie. And she's like, why? And I'm like, The Clash, it's called Straight to Hell by The Clash. And I said, this was a sample from Straight to Hell by The Clash. Wow. And I thought that this producer came up with this, this whole composition by himself. And I was like applauding him. For, and it's still great, but there was a there was, it was, it was a sample and I did not know it was a sample and I had not given the clash credit where credit was due. And, yeah. you know, that's why it's so important that I, I that bringing me, I'm in a full circle, this, like how I love and respect how you honor Frank Frazetta as the one who inspired your career and, and you make that known to the world. And, and I think that a lot of people, um, you know, such as my grandpa at times, he wouldn't really know the people that came before him. And it's like, as creators, we're always going to be pulling from the things that are resonating with us. And it doesn't mean that it's not that it's that we, we should do that. We have to do that. That's, that's where we get our source of information. And then it's our responsibility to just, you know, put put inject us into it, our, you know, our our essence into it. So I thank you for doing that. I mean, I, I just, it, it's, it's really, it means a lot to me. And I, I know it would have meant a lot, it meant a lot to him when, when people, when people, um, other creators credited him, it, it was, you know, really, so it's really important. So yeah, that's, and, and now you, Patrick, who, who, who do you listen to when you paint? Well, I was on a loop with um, John Coltrane and Pharaoh Saunders. So I like jazz music because it, it doesn't have words. Where's the words? Uh -huh. And so yeah. I, don't, I don't get distracted by it, uh, but I've been listening to, I, uh, you know, Amazon, they're just great marketers. You know, I found that if I have prime, I can have prime music with it. And so I just mm -hmm. get on that. And I was listening to the new music that I, you know, wouldn't have branched into it. What was it? I was listening to the cosmic, the comet is coming yesterday. Uh, they're a new band and boy, I was just, okay. it was incredible. And it was John Coltrane with younger guys, you know, that's why I, I hooked onto it. And Mogwai, yeah. all these new bands that are coming out, Mogwai and Mono, they're not new. They're probably 20 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, I'm listening. New to you. Yeah. No, and it's like, there's so much, there's so many artists out there. There's so many visual artists, so many musicians. And it's sometimes I, I, I don't know if you ever do this, but sometimes I think I get really sad and I'm like, I, I. I, I want to like live long enough to explore all of the, yeah. <laughs> to see everything and hear everything. And that's just not possible. And it's kind of a, de a yeah. depressing thought, but, but it's also motivating to, to try every day to, to, you know, to, to open yourself up to new and, and, and emerge yourself. And so my grandpa, what I mentioned earlier to, to fully answer the, the question, my grandfather listened to um, a lot of classical music he was very inspired. Um, mostly when he was painting his oils, he would listen to um, the, the composer Stravinsky. Yeah. And uh, Stravinsky's compositions were very powerful. You can hear most of them in, in Fantasia. Uh, Do you know that Dis 
he wasn't happy with what Disney did with his music, which I found was, I was like, oh. what? How? It was crazy because that Fantasia is one of my grandfather's favorite movies. And yeah. I think, you know, visually it was, it, I, I loved Fantasia. I loved everything about Fantasia. Yeah. Um, but so, so Fantasia, the Stravinsky and then Frank Sinatra, but Frank Sinatra was usually on when he was with, with his kids or, you know, developing film in his dark room or just, you know, hanging out, eating a cannoli or, a, you know, whatever he, whatever he was, Italian food he was eating at the moment. He just had Frank Sinatra as his, like, his theme for life. Like his, his yeah. Frank Frazetta mood was Frank Sinatra. Like he, he loved Frank Sinatra. He was, that was, that was his like guy. I mean, him, Ro Frank Sinatra and Robert Mitchum, those were his two like Hollywood heartthrobs where if he could be like someone, he would be like them. Yeah. There was a weird story actually, sorry, it just came through my head. So maybe you know about it too. Uh, or maybe I'm just mad. But was there a time when Roy Crinkle was gifted or didn't, wasn't gifted, uh, a Buck Rogers drawing and he waited outside a concert and give it to Frank Sinatra. And then Frank told him to go and get it back. Am I crazy? Have you heard anything? Else? I I don't I don't know if I've heard that one, but I do know my grandpa. He he I saw this not too long ago. It was like a um a character of, of Frank Sinatra with a bunch of girls swooning. And I do his sister confirmed this that he was at the Frank Sinatra concert and he was trying to give it to Frank. Um, I don't know, but I don't know if he ever actually successfully did that or not. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I think that maybe I'm sure there were more times that he tried to get in with Frank Sinatra and, and you know, have him see him because that, like I said, that was his idol. So it, it would have been, it would have been, he would have probably said like, now I can die now. Frank Sinatra has acknowledged me. And then now I'm my every, all my wishes are fulfilled. <laughs> That's how much he meant to him. Oh yeah. Imagine. Yeah. So he had his hero as well. And, you yeah. know, we have we have Frank. No, sir, I was just thinking about during the conversation here about Frank had a stroke in, when he was 68. And I did the math on this painting here. And this was a year before. This is Frank at 67. To paint mm -hmm. like that at 67 is already an incredible feat. But look at this. This is when Frank was 46. 46 mm -hmm. perhaps is that the, is the math right there yeah you, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, math. I'm like yeah yeah hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the pull same. my calculator hold on <laughs> let's, let's say it is but look let's at see. that there's 46 there's 67 it's just breathless the, the amount of the 46 key. you're right 46. yeah and then yep. 67 the, the energy throughout that entire career is it, just astonishing to me he that never lost, like when, with, but aside from the, you know, the sicknesses and it inhibited it, but when he would feel better again and things were balanced, I would, oh, it would come out. I mean, he was, he was, a, I mean, even as an old fragile man of 84 years old, shuffling around with his oxygen tank, he was ready to fight. Like if he had to fight, he would have like tried to fight. I mean, that was, that was the spirit of Frank Frazetta. He was always, he, what he did with, with infusing himself was he, took all of the competitive nature that he had. And I, I believe that is also inherent um, yeah. with sports and with movement and with the action of life. And, and he put himself into, into all of his art. And that was him. He was a very, he was, a, he was a very athletic man. And I mean, a lot of the poses we, we talked about um, a little before we, we came on live, a lot of the, the things like it, his mission statement that he never used any, any references. Um, we, we can get into like why, why that happened. Um, but he definitely used himself mostly as references and he was, it was pretty incredible because he was that athletic and, and, and uh, I mean, it just, the, his range of motion in his body like from athleticism and, and his ability to like stretch he, he could get in most of those poses. So most of the, most of the characters you see in his paintings other than the female are, are Frank. And yeah. I think that's pretty incredible. And I can, I can feel it too. And there's another thing just here. Someone mentioned once that he, he modeled some of his Conan's on um, Jack Palance. And if that is not Jack Palance there, then nobody is right there. Yeah. The return yeah. of the mucker. This one doesn't yeah. get love, I don't think, this painting. Go ahead, sir. You, have you got a thought on that? 
No, I, I agree with you. It's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely the, the he, I think, I think a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of the, the people that he pulled from were celebrities at film from the film. He loved films. So I think yeah. it was just a, a subconscious pulling and, and that's just what happened. But this one, I, I, the power of the fact that he was, the, what people say about this, the story behind this painting, the fact that he was strong enough to just take down this guy and the horse. I mean, that's, there's <laughs> a lot, there's a lot going on in here. And I just, that, that's kind of like my grandpa's sense of humor coming out. He was also, he was this, always called himself an enigma because, you know, he, and it was, it's, I, I hate when people say, oh, this uh, man, he was really sensitive. It's like, well, yeah, men are, men are also human beings. Like there's, <laughs> there's sensitivity in, in women and men and we're all humans. So of course, but I think at the time when he was growing up, men had to be a certain way to society. It was, it was a hard, harder time to, to, you know, you had to, uh, the men had come from generations and generations of war and you didn't have time to have emotions so that kind of just trickled through so my grandpa was very um he was very hesitant to to show that emotional side and and I think that was like with what, what art was to him was such a, a way that he could get it all out there and and have that outlet for him so he did that with his with his sense of humor with his with his emotions with his sensitivity he was able to have that outlet, which I think is such a beautiful thing. Oh, wonderful, sir. And we, you're giving him great tribute today as well. And, you know, I want to, at this point anyway, if I can start drawing over someone's work and say why, you know, why it's so special to me. Yes. And, and someone asked a question there, what is your favorite ink drawing from Frank Rosetta? I don't even have to hesitate. It's this one here. I When I first saw this, I it was inhuman. I just went... I thought about this the way I think about Michelangelo's David. It's impossible. It's impossible. But here it is. How is it possible when it's impossible? How can anyone draw this? It's a, it's, impo it's impossible. Yet, <laughs> yeah, there I, it I is. agree with you. There it is. I agree with you. Even if he Don't pulled, you just like this, the foliage, yeah. like it's the, the, the people, like it's so impressive, but just like the landscape and the foliage yeah. and like the way that he put an energy into a leaf. Like, yeah. like, how do you do that? Like you said, it's it's impossible. It's yeah. just this like he created this world that it's it a world of its own that you want to just step in and be like, I want yeah. this. I want the world to look like this. That where where I am. I want I want to be in this this reality. So yeah, it's I, he was very happy with these pieces. I mean, he he at times would get a little insecure about certain oils, like I said, and go back and re, retouch them, but. With his inks, it was never a question. It was like, I did yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's all me, power. He was very proud of himself with his inks, yeah. as, as he should be. His inks, well, someone actually said he'd be remembered for his inks. It sort of stopped me in my tracks. But when you look at the inks, they are incredible. And I loved that he also, and it's not showing here visibly, that he used watered inks too. So someone's pumped the volume up on this and took the, the grays on. So there's beautiful grays that are missing from this too, where he does the mm -hmm. wash as well. And that's part of it's impossible to me, you know, that he was so yeah. loose and so tight when he needed to be. And look at the compression of those gluteus against that arm there, for instance. It's just real. This is, and like I said, if you posed uh, models, they, you would never get that energy. It just is impossible. He drew it. <laughs> he drew this. Yeah. Just like Michelangelo carved that statue with thought calipers at points because the hand's bigger than a normal hand. The, you can see in that statue that it wasn't measure and then chip, measure and chip. And that's yeah. what's what's impossible about this. This is not a traced drawing over photographs or anything like that. It's just sensational. And you can tell as well that this arm would be more foreshortened if it was a photographic trace. So that's, mm -hmm. how, the human, that's how the human eye sees it. And so the proof positive there, when Frank said he didn't use reference on this drawing, I... I believe that 100%. That is an amazing piece of work. And most of the time, like, it, that's, it shouldn't take away, like, I mean, what, when, when he said with his artist statement that he never used them, that's when people were like, wait, like, hold on, let's, let's like track back a little bit. But most of the time, you're correct. He did not use references. Um, it was, it was really when he was stuck on a certain pose or 
he was stuck on some lighting. He'd have my grandma pose. And a lot of, a lot of fans have said, oh, I, I see your grandmother in every piece. And I, I defend my grandfather. And then I go, no, no, no. He had a lot of muses and inspiration and not to discredit my grandmother. Like, of course, that was his main yeah. Rosetta girl, his inspiration, but he found beauty in all sorts of women. And even from his youngest inspiration was his, like his sister, his sister Adele, who was just uh, a female version of Frank. So he would, he would reference her a lot in his early works. And, um, but yeah, most, most of it was just this. He, I think, I think why he was able to get away with not using the references was, was simply because he really did have a photographic memory. He could take things from scenes and films or whatever. And he just kind of like put it all there and cataloged it like subconsciously, which was, again, it's a genius. Yeah. Well, there's no training like comic book drawing. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's true. It's amazing. I mean, there's no models here. You can tell it's just fantastic. And what I love about Frank as well is because he's not using models, he gets an energy that's impossible. If you are tracing a drawing or tracing a photograph, I mean, look at the, and you know, we talk about um, anatomy. He's the master mm -hmm. of it. And, you know, maybe a less informed mind would say, well, it doesn't look realistic to me. But well, that's not the point. I mean, look at those obliques, for instance, just right there. That's a master stroke in understanding anatomy so well you can simplify it into shapes. It's just incredible. I know he studied Bridgman, the Bridgman book, but he went way beyond that. You know, look at them. Here's I'm going to start now, Sarah, if we're, we're good to, with why, yeah. as an artist's appreciation, why I um, marvel at Frank and why I think he's so wonderful, if we can do that. But I'd love to hear your insights, too. And maybe if, if you read in the comments, maybe there's something... Hey, Patrick, what's your favorite? Oh, it's still that ink toy. And Des Embry's just praising the, the ink as well. Mm -hmm. Sarah, did yeah, you... I'm, I'm excited to hear more. I mean, you are the one that understands art here and in, in, in this discussion. So I, I want, I'm looking forward to learning more from you. So please okay. take it away. Well, I'll take it away. I'll take it away. Now, what I love about all of this, for, look at that little face, for instance, just right there, just the simplicity of that little face is just so great that he's just basically given us only that little tiny thing. And it's shown so much energy to it. Whereas a, a full-fledged uh, photographic rendering of that would never have this little beauty in here, that little top lip coming up, it's so beautiful. And he was always brilliant at this frontalis. And the more you push that frontalis forward, the more childlike it gets. So you had these childlike women that were just marvelous and it has that sense of innocence to it. So they, there was a whole uh, breadth to his work that appealed to so many people. And these masses of shadows were a lesser artist who put detail in there, you know, just right into bleeding right into that. And even as a kid, I didn't understand it, but still loved it. And you can just see the bare board, the confidence of that's done. Let's move up here. Look at those brush strokes. Boom, boom, boom. So I think that Frank would have, I think he'd have painted this in a day. I've no doubt at all. Because the confidence is there. You know, look at that thorax, the rib cage pulling out. The idea of he was embracing the story in every mark he made. He's taking a breath for the shot with the arrow. It's not someone posing with an arrow. It's someone alive in this, in this world. And look at the arch in here. And all those little moments of, of anatomy, look at that, that little point where we get to the iliac crest and then the leg inserting in here. But we didn't get a realistic leg. In fact, how could he say so much with so little there? It's astonishing. Just a few tones. It's beautiful. And all of it is, every time I look at a Frank Frazetta, I, I go, it's awesome. I, I can't believe it. Every time I look at it again, I don't think this one gets enough love. I, uh, this one, it, Patrick, can we go back to the other one real quick? John Gore yeah. writes back. Yeah. I want to ask you if you've noticed this before. I, I never noticed until then it was, it was called out, but you notice how the arrow is not in front of him, how it's behind, impossible oh, yeah, behind yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. And, and when, when people would point that out, um, critics, because they'd like, Oh, well, look, look what you've done. It's, it's not, yeah. this, this is, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. And he was like, if I put that in front of his face, it would have taken away the entire energy and mood of this piece. 
just like he chose to to do that with with silver warrior with the polar yeah. bears and he's like i'm not going to put reins on them it takes it's it's too messy so i love that you point that all out for for me it's like knowing again knowing where to where to enhance and where to shadow and that yeah. does take a lot of confidence it's it's, it's yeah. really quite incredible okay so to sun goddess i i, I love i want to talk about sun goddess and hear what yeah. you have to say about sun goddess and that was interesting what you said there, because on the Egyptian princess as well, he has, um, the. let's go back to it actually. He has the robe go all the way down to the floor, but we don't see the connection point mm -hmm. because it would have ruined the, it just would have ruined the artwork right here. So he's just chosen to show the obliques. That's all. And then we have the robe start. It's just gorgeous. And those little moments weren't lost on me. Even as a child, I'd go, what? Where's the string as if it matters? So we all say stupid things, you know, we all go, oh, well, that anatomy, uh, you know, it's too long for a figure. Well, the artist chose it to be longer. You know, that's 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 when we we do what the camera can't do. And that's where the- I almost wonder if he was trying to do this intentionally, like aside from um, just having his, his own creativity and his own, you know, take on the subjects, it's like, I wonder if he was like, oh, try to copy this, you know, like I speculate that like, oh, yeah, try to try to recreate this. It's impossible because I just know that how, that's how his mind was um, as much as he wanted other artists to be inspired by him. He didn't he never he didn't like when artists would just would would, would replicate him too closely. Yeah. So yeah. I, I and I had just a, a theory that popped in my mind just now. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. My grandpa was an interesting character. I wonder if that was a thought process at all. <laughs> But yeah, I've always because when I've when I've studied Egyptian queen, I'm like, what do I do here? Unless you really know uh, what you're doing and have that confidence, it's pretty hard to to just like try to emulate it with no knowledge of basic basing it, just copying it. It's like yeah. almost impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's have a look at this one then. Um, so this was where Frank would go back into the painting he really wanted to do, and I think that was a smart idea. Like when I was working in illustration, I didn't want to do the illustration. I just wanted to do a painting for myself. And I came to the conclusion that I would, I would take the dirty money and then I would paint the picture just for me. I wouldn't even think of the art director. Of course, the art director comes in anyway and stops that, that wonder that you're enjoying. I did a painting once and he said, can you turn the header on? I already painted the head. I said, what? Well, I reach into the, and turn the header on, you know? And what it was is technology got to the point where 3D, they were actually doing that in 3D. And I went, I'm yeah. out of here. But I always did that. I always uh, painted the picture for me once I got all the business side out of it. And I think Frank was doing that here. Just This is just me getting in another artist's head from my head, that mm -hmm. paint the picture and then paint the real picture. You know, here's the picture. Are you happy with it? Okay, now I can, I can really paint it because the deadline would have been a week or something. And Absolutely. He, he, he has improved this so much. Look at everything. It's just, oh, let's have a look at the anatomy over here. And this is not me saying, oh, Frank, you could have done better anatomy. I know that he didn't use a reference because the anatomy was off. So that's what I'm looking mm -hmm. at. That's the reason why I know. And that makes it even more brilliant. I go, wow. He the arm, the arm specifically, yeah. right, of that girl is yeah. like just right away. You go right to it and go, oh, no. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, that dis maybe maybe if it was dislocated, right? Like if it was completely yeah, dislocated. We could do that. Let's say they broke or broke the arm to put it into that nasty. Could have been. Yeah. <laughs> but there's things that I really love, like that face, I still love it. So I, I'm really glad we have reference of both versions of it. But if we look closer, that Conan is too big, you know? That Conan's so big that it would be probably here for the scale of it, compared to this guy here. Now he could be a dwarf. Uh and Conan could be a right. giant. There's no doubt about it. But obviously Frank came back and said, no, it's it's too it's too close. And the deltoids are, you know, they're in their own place. They're basketballed over here. He obviously saw it all because look at the magic here, where he's come back in and he's just brought it in so beautifully. Look at all those shapes. I don't want to bore everyone with the anatomical names and everything, but Frank was so great at forearms. And he really knew where to put that brachior, that brachior radialis point there. And if you can see that, that hand coming in where the thumb comes toward the body, that's called pronation. And if you can do that from imagination, you know everything. That's amazing. So he's pronated. This is the, the moment where the pronation happens here. He has pronated that right around 
and given us the extensors on one side and the more gestural flexors on the other side. With so much power, you couldn't do it without all of that knowledge and this interosseous business there. That's the last I'm going to say about anatomy or otherwise everyone will go to sleep. Now I'm going to carry on. Oh, this is great. This is great. I'm, just, I'm in a trance now. So good. Keep going. <laughs> I, 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 need to, I need to be paying you, Patrick. Like this is the, the, what we all do. It's an art lesson. It's great. Thank you. Uh, no, it's brilliant. Maybe it'll gel afterwards. So I'll put it in anyway. But the fact that he had that sartorius. Now that sartorius for me, it's the longest muscle in the body. And it goes behind this vastus medialis here. The fact that he put it in in such a simple, confident way is just godlike. It is really godlike. And then, as if that wasn't enough bravura, let's throw a shadow over that links those, those muscle groups in a, a, a system like that and just let it fade into shadow. It, it's beautiful. And this biceps femoris just overlap in there. He wasn't afraid to overlap. And that's what you can see. I, we used to see art, it was called fuzzy art. And it was when people didn't know their anatomy and they just fuzzed it. And so they would, they would go, I don't know what overlaps here. And they would just do that. And there's Frank very clearly put in that tendon right where it should be. And I always loved his box knees, the way he knew where that patella was. And I was talking with Steve Houston and he drew um, a leg as a demonstration. And I thought in my head, that's a Frank Frazetta knee. And immediately when I thought it in my head, Frank said, this is a Frank Frazetta knee. And so look how many artists he's touched. That brilliant Steve Houston is acknowledging Frank wow. Frazetta from all these years. It's incredible. It's, it's incredible. amazing. Amazing. And this all by how, how he saw the body and, and, and knew the yeah. body. Yeah, yeah. He, he really did. And the, the improvement on this female figure, look at the breath being taken in now when he has the time to come back and think about it the breath coming in, the turning of the head forward like that. This pulsating of the, the lower abs and then this turnaround as the leg goes in to the picture. So much more beautiful than what we have here. Even like I said, I still love this head. This arm is way too short. He would have seen all of that. He would have seen all of that because he came back and he foreshortened it. Look at that. It's this replay here is just so masterful i i'm almost in tears looking at it at how brilliant it was and to scrape back a painting and do that was astonishing because i don't think this is a, a another painting i think this is a repaint what do you yep. think sir it is it was, it, yep yep so imagine he just he, just he didn't want to do a second one for whatever i mean he did some set he did um he did a couple of um repaints um if he had sold a painting and then he wanted to my grandma like for instance was like oh, how you know we, we sold that so he did two versions of princess of mars two versions of tarzan at the earth's core yeah. um but this one but most of them were repaints like if he I, I think like you said if he came in and he noticed like some like like for real flaws that really stuck out like that arm being too short he would yeah. just be like, I'm starting completely getting rid of these subjects and starting over. Yeah. And there were no no questions asked because they were, they were his paintings. So he could do whatever he yeah. wanted with them. He's the boss of his own paintings. And, exactly. And that is the right way for me. It's either scrape it all back or start again. It's, it's not, oh, let's fix this and fix that. Because something else is going to get broken by doing that too. So exactly. the, the, the confidence just off it comes. I remember he said to... Arnie, Arnie Fenner said, told a story about the destroyer. And let's see if we can find the destroyer in here. I'm not sure if I have it. And he said it was the Buccaneer. It was called Conan the Buccaneer in the, in the comic mm -hmm. books or the paperbacks. I'll just try and find it. And he said, two he, he, there's two versions. You wanted to fix it. I agree with Arnie, Arnie Fenner. I love both of them. Because I saw Conan the, and the Buccaneer. It was one of the first presenters I saw on a boot jacket. Yeah. And we're talking that, about that. The, the first ahead. one, I was a little bit more partial to the first one. And it's just like you said, it's, it's subjective. It's, yeah. um, I'm, I'm glad he did a repaint on this, uh, Conan the, the Sacrifice, uh, the Avenger. But the the, um, the Destroyer, the Buccaneer, I was a little bit like, oh, no, not there we go. There, there it is. Was it there? Passed it. Go right. up again. Oh, there we there go. There we go. All right, so here they are both. 
Now, this is- so that's the first version. Yeah. And the colors yeah. are often different. This is the color I remember. I think this has been faded in the sun. This is what I remember seeing. And remember now, sir, this is a four by six book. Right? It's that size. And even more now, to get the whole picture in, we're looking at a four by four inch artwork. Right? And I walk into a rainy mm -hmm. shop in Belfast in Ireland when it was rubble. And I walk into a bookstore and I'm transfixed by this four by four inch picture that I've got my face up. I can't afford the book. I got my face up to that picture like that. The guy must have thought there's something wrong with that kid just staring, you know, like, you know, he needs some help. Somebody go and get him some help because I was 16 or something or 14. And I'm just staring at it going, my God. For about, I would. <laughs> He didn't just give you the book. I would have just given, I'm like, this, he needs this book. <laughs> he says, he, no, he says, he says, you either buy or you get out. It was something like that. Oh, like, oh. well, tough times, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it can't ever be a charity, always be a charity, but <laughs> yeah. that I would have, oh, um, <laughs> he did not give you the book. Um, no. But you know, it's funny you say that with with um, the, the time that you took, you mentioned that earlier, staring at them for five minutes each in the, in the museum and yeah. being a young boy and staring at them. And I do remember, funny enough, I remember being a little girl and I would be in the museum and I would be wondering why these people are just staring at the art for, for like you know, <laughs> five, five to 10 minutes. I'm like, something wrong with them because I, 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 I myself was I mean it was just to me it was just grandpa's artwork everywhere and I, I'd look at it and feel something but yeah it's, it's just amazing to me again because you're you're such a you're such an amazing artist yourself that that's that's what it did to you you just want to get taken every single detail and yeah that's just such a, such a beautiful thing as a child I didn't understand now as an adult doing what I do I'm like this that's that's beautiful the longer people like yourself and artists stare at it the, the more you can try to dissect everything and there weren't he didn't really talk about his his technique or his thought process very often so you doing this is like such a an amazing I'm, I'm sitting here and internalizing this but I have to externalize it and just tell you thank you for doing this because I've been like wanting to to sit down with an artist like a, a caliber like yourself and and for you to dissect this and and teach me more about his just like the, what you see in, in his technique. So thank you for doing this. It means oh, so much. You're really. welcome. And thank you, Sarah, for bringing this new book out as well to keep this oh my gosh this, this legacy yes. alive. I mean, I've got them all. I just buy them all. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You gotta have all the Frazetta books. You have, have to. them all. But yeah. This this one is the one that, you know, I just, I want it even twice as big if we can. They'll probably only sell four <laughs> copies, but I'll buy one. So I can't wait for it. I, and, and you 11 do, pounds, 11 pounds. That's, that's big. It's a big I'll boy. Do, do some bicep curls with it. <laughs> but you, you made that happen. We don't have that book without you. So that's astonishing. So thank you for that. You know, I can go now. I'm done. My, my, <laughs> my job is done. You know, you know, no. you know, I wish, oh, I wish they'd do it. I wish you went and did it. Brilliant. We did. I said, you know, I, I, I walked into a Barnes and Noble and, and later a Tashin flagship store in Miami, Florida. And I looked at the books and I looked at how Tashin, how they were so incredibly attuned to detail with every paper yeah. choice with with the editors just being so meticulous at everything every detail and that to me resonated because i was like my grandpa like we're talking about right now with from kneecaps to certain lighting everything was so thought through and i believe mm -hmm. anything that we do from here on out has to be that level of excellence because that's what my grandfather would have wanted and that's what he deserves and that's what his fans deserve so seeing this book come finally come to to a, a tangible item when it's been you know we've been we've been working on this for years now so it's just it's truly it's it, it does seem surreal um but I, I, when I see, I, sometimes when I'm like seeing the unboxings and, and, and watching them come and, and people are getting them, I'm like, oh good, it's real. Wait, I have to wake up and be like, did this really happen? Did these get printed? Because I'm, I'm not going to go into the hurdles, but to the hurdles we had to go over to make this book happen. It definitely, I, I've got some grays going on and that's because of this yeah. book. <laughs> it was, it was a labor of love. And I just, I believe if you 
believe that something should be in the world, you have to sometimes fight for it. And that's exactly what we did. We fought to make this, to make this a reality. Yeah. And here it is. Here it's it amazing. is. It's amazing. And what it's going to be like for you to open that book. I think this guy's got particular oh. big hands too. So he's making that. I'm going to cry. Yeah. I, I have pretty big hands too. So my unboxing might look about the same, but <laughs> he's making that look small. I, yeah, he is. He is. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it, you know, what, what I loved about Tashin too was they were, and this was, this was one of the stressors and this is, you know, this is something that you have to deal with, but, um, and, and, you know, you, you have books and you know, the, the, what, what goes, what goes on in making a book. It's a lot of, oh, yeah. it's a labor of love. Yeah. Um, but, but Tashin in particular, they were very particular, they were, they really, really wanted to get the paintings to be exactly what they look like in their real form. And yeah. a lot of the scans we had had are were older um, and they were touched up like over the years, the, the files that we had had and they, they weren't acceptable to Tashin because Tashin was like, we sure. want the most raw file. We want to see the artwork exactly as it is. And I actually saw a few comments um, from people who, who bought, it was actually one comment, I'm exaggerating, but he <laughs> had made a comment that he made a comment that a few of the paintings were darker than they should be. And yeah. I, I, I wanted to say to him, it's like, well, this actually, that's what the painting really looks like. Um, the paintings had been digitally enhanced over the years. So you just might not be used to seeing it yeah. in its original form because you like you, Patrick, you've been to the museum, you've seen the originals, like they, they are, a lot of them are darker. Um, his one, yeah. his one that comes to mind, it was the Oakdale affair, the bear uh, that hangs in the museum in Boca Grande. And it's a very dark painting. I mean, would, we have to get the lighting just right so you can actually see the painting. Otherwise, it's, it's so dark. You have to yeah. go up to it and go, what, what am I looking at here? So that was a very important process with Tashin and Diane Hansen, who is the editor. She just did an astounding job at getting with collectors and photographing original artwork. So that was very important. I think it's important for, for collectors and artists alike and, and just for Zeta fans in general to see what the painting, so many people will never have an opportunity to go see an original. So to have this book and be able to look through and say like, oh, wow, these are, these are the exact colors. This is what the painting actually looks like. That's something really special. Yeah, I can't wait. You got me drooling. Oh. I drool out of one <laughs> soft. I, wait for it. I didn't put this together until you have them side by side wow okay yeah yeah i want to show uh the influence i mean it's, you know here's the hard, here's the tough thing with frank Frazetta, is that every time i think i've got a great idea frank's already done it so i think <laughs> work hard work hard get the best the perfect and then i thought oh, frank's already done that hasn't he so i often repeat and it's also in the subconscious i mean i've looked at his art so much that i felt like yeah. i painted them I painted them as well because I've, I know every little stroke of them. So when I had to do this uh, for a wonderful collector, uh, she's got a load of my stuff. It's just all over her house. And she teaches Greek myths at Harvard. And she just bought uh, one painting after another and just gave me the freedom to paint. And it was just so beautiful. And I always loved the Moon Maid. I always loved it. And Sarah, you know the, the artwork. So once again, we're looking at digital here. I'm guessing from my memory, I'll just copy this. From my memory, would this maybe have looked a little bit more like that? But you tell me. I'm going to just tweak it here. Let's see. Just for a second. No. I'll just take the color out as well, I think. But you tell me. I might be wrong here. Is the original maybe more like that? Yep. And, and yeah. because he was, his colors were not, they, they were vivid in places, but it wasn't, it was a little bit, if I'm using that term correct, like a little bit of more of a, a muted palette in yeah. general. Um, and yeah, I, 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 it's again, so many people are used to seeing it so digitally enhanced. And yeah. if you've seen the originals, you realize, oh no, they're actually very close to what you just did. We're going to have to talk to you, Patrick, about getting all the, <laughs> back to their natural forms. Well, this, this is me remembering. <laughs> I remember, do this? This, is, this was 2016 I'm drawing in. This is when I had my nose to the painting, the actual painting. But yeah, that's why I like Tashin books as well. Because I give up buying the Marvel books. 
because I wanted to get that nostalgic rush from buying Marvel's reprints of, you know, John Buscema's books and stuff, you know. And then I got one after the other, and they were so digitally boosted in color that it just lost all its charm. And so yeah. I stopped buying them, and I would love to buy them all. But I'm not going to buy another book that's been digitally boosted. It's not the original art anymore. And Tashin exactly. have brought out, yeah, Tashin brought out two books already, the Avengers and also um, Spider-Man, and they've scanned the original comic books so that we get that same feel. You can almost smell the ink as you lift it, and you get that that childhood rush again. It's the it's the McGain, but bigger, you know. And we can't hope for yeah. more. And I have, and this is universal. I have collectors. Uh, I get on to, I'm wearing this shirt. This is a Canadian shirt from Mississauga for my two collectors, mm. Neil and Lee, if they're watching. I always wear it in honor of them. And they, we talk, we discussed this podcast before the podcast. The three of us sat and we just talked and talked about how wonderful, what can we ask? And, you know, that was one of the, the things that came up that the Tashin book, Thank God they've got it. You know, we we want that that thing again because they too are not interested in these books that don't aren't true to the original thing. So it's so important to me, and that's why I took the colors out there uh, just to see if that was the memory correct. But I wanted to talk about also um, wh why Frank again has been so important to draw on. When I was, I swear to you, sir, this is the truth. I didn't know I was painting the Moon Maid when I did this, and that's the absolute truth. I knew I was painting Palace of Medusa and it was the Egyptian queen revisited when I did it. But this one, I didn't. It wasn't until I was halfway through it. I went, it's the moon maid. You dumbass. You've gone and well, done that again. <laughs> but you know what? You're, you're not a dumbass. You're just, a, <laughs> you're just, well, you just had it in your subconscious. And, and yeah. my grandpa, again, this was like, he was, he was only human. So sometimes yeah. when he was quoted saying one thing and then it would, it would cancel out another thing and contradict. Um, my grandfather has many instances of, 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 of pulling from Hal Foster and yeah. Joseph Clement Cole and, and J. Allen St. John and, and Roy Crankle, many, many ink techniques and compositions. Roy Crankle was a huge influence. And I, again, I, I don't, he, he would always say that, oh, this was his original, but, but there were times when it was, it was not exact, but very, very similar to what you just showed me with your artwork. And, and, and he, I don't think he consciously did it. And that's just because he, he looked at the other artists so often that's just bound to happen. Yeah. So it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I love your, I love your, what, what's the um, a name of it? Official name of that, the title? The painting that's, the moon that's Cleo. And I'm trying to remember who the scholar is. It's just lost my mind for a minute. Cause I'm all, I'm all starstruck. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> it's Cleo anyway. She so she has this Cleo. guy. He looks after her, and it's a Greek myth. But I'll have to. It was in my head a second ago. Oh, it's just flown out again. You know how that happens. <laughs> okay. so it'll be in here, I think. Oh no, I know where we'll find it. Oil painting masterclass. So this was the last oil painting book I did. Let's just have a look, and you can see Frank everywhere. I mean, the color choices, everything. It's Frank. You know, thanks, Frank. You know, it's all been due to him and Boris and lots of different influences as well. There's me halfway through that painting, just blocking it in. Uh, I well, love and then people are going to say it's all Patrick J. Jones, like the next to come, <laughs> the next generation that is so inspired by you. I mean, because it's, I, I just see like, your colors are so unique. Um, and, and like I said, your, your essence and your style comes out uh, so profoundly. It's just such a, and I, I mean, from what I gather, just seeing like the, the choices of your palette, I just get such like a an other an otherworldly, very like that the texture of that curtain behind her. I mean, that's just like yeah. insane. It's it's gorgeous. It's it's so well thought out. And again, it just evokes. I I, I have a lot of like um I don't know I guess like just very like a, a dramatic feel. Like it makes me feel. Um, I don't know. Like I, I, I can't, I can't explain it with words. I just, it's very, it's very provoking of a, of a, of a, like a strong emotion of, of moodiness and like sultry her face and that the way I love how like with her, I, I just go right to the this is the Frazetta in me, but her breasts like the way that they just sit so perfectly and they they you you have like the the feel of gravity there. It's like 
So really, it's just beautiful. So as much, and I, of course, I see the Frazetta, I see the B Vallejo influence, but I just want to keep reiterating to you that you're there, your Patrick J. Jones comes out full <laughs> through and through. And when I, when I first saw your artwork, I didn't, I didn't tie it together as a, as a viewer of it. I didn't even know how much they influenced you until, until pretty recently. So I, I just see your style as, as you. And I see you making a huge footprint on on culture today. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, I don't know. I can't speak now. You're taking all my all my speech. Oh, away. well. <laughs> <laughs> you need to hear it. It's true. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Thank you. And so just to give credit to the models, see, I do use models. And this is Alana Brickelmans. And Alana Brickelmans, and it's insightful what you said, Sarah, that there's an emotion. And I don't, I don't, apart from a quick sketch that I just show and then I take it away and then I give an emotion. I, I give the emotion to Alana because she's, just, you know, she is, uh, she's a doctor of, of anthropology. She understands how human nature works. And so I, I, and she's an artist too. She's great at everything she does. Just one of those people that are always great at what they do. And I give her an emotion. I tell the story, you know, the story being something like you, you're spite, you've been, you know, you've got spite in your heart, but you still have the love for this man. And you're going to give me that look, you know, and you're still, even though your heart is broken, you're still superior here. You're not going to take any of this guff from this guy. You're still, you're going to do better. You're going to go on in, in life and, and show him, right? So that's the idea. And look what we get, just amazing stuff. But on that, yeah. on that thing, I mean, from the model, but on that point, going back to uh, Cain of the Golden Seas, if anyone sees this painting, it's mm -hmm. mine. It's been, it's gone. It's been vanished off this earth. Somebody has this. I hope. I'd rather that some kid in a dorm has it stuck on their wall with, with drafting pins than it being in a gutter somewhere. This didn't reach its yeah. destination. This did not reach its, its destination. So. Gone. So that, how, that, that your, yours is gone. This yes, but this makes more sense because this is gone via FedEx. So I know how it vanished. It vanished on route. Oh, but no, I know. But That's, oh my god, and a double whammy. Do you have any theories of what happened? Like what? Did, oh yeah, did, oh yeah, I have theories. Okay, about. FedEx. That's my theory. Delivered an empty tube for collection. There was nothing in it. who would send a plastic tube from Australia to the US, an empty plastic tube, tube that's worth about five dollars, and pay sixty dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars actually to send it. And they they signed for that. So I will never ever, this is a cautionary tale for anyone, never ever have a third party sign for your for your painting. Make sure it goes directly to the collector and the collector takes it from FedEx. Because the collector would never have taken that tube and said, yeah. Oh, thanks very much. It said, where's the painting? So somewhere in Good the- advice. Good advice. We... That's tragic. When, what year was that? When did that happen to you? That was not that long ago. That looks like- uh, uh, 2018, uh. 2018. So uh, yeah, what, what happened, I think, is they opened it in customs and then it just slid mm -hmm. out of the tube. Somebody's holding it like that, and I put the cat back on. So we chased all the customs areas. We we went phoned America at every station, and they said we clean it out at night so it's gone if it was there. I hope somebody has it on the wall. But if anyone finds that, please, it's mine. I'll give you a, a reward for it. Just send oh, it, or God. just let me know who you are. So yeah, that's it. I'm so goes, sorry. That's terrible. Yeah, it's fine. I'll tell you where I got strength from. I know that uh, Roy Crinkle was a great historian of art, and he um, he loved an Australian artist here called Norman Lindsay, and he introduced Norman. Frank to Norman Lindsay, right? And Norman Lindsay yeah. was a brilliant artist. He sent yes. his entire works to the U.S., his entire works for a big exhibition. It was going to change his life in the U.S. The Puritans got on the train, took every single painting out, and burnt them. Burned every single one. Oh my God. Now, wow. Roy, because they said, you know, he was a spawn of the devil or something, you know, they, whatever it was, they didn't like the nudity and they set fire to his entire collection. <gasps> now, How many pieces were there? In that I don't know. He, he was oh. very prolific. So let's say it was a hundred at, at an estimate because it was on a train. It's on, it was bulk for a big exhibition. Roy Crinkle got the news back to him and he said, it's okay. 
I'll just paint more. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cry tears over one painting, but I'm very, very cautious of it. This is a this is a painting I did recently here, and it's it's all about Frank here. Now there's a lot of Boris in this in the finish. So I'm getting a little bit of both these guys. But what I have in here from Frank is the push and torque of anatomy and changing it. You know, I know what all these muscles in here, so I won't bore everybody with them. It's more to do with the rhythm of them, that this scapula can lead right through here, down into these obliques and into the serratus muscles, more importantly, and that the ribs can follow that, that in fashion. Now, I had a good model, but none of that rhythm was there. I changed it. I did a Michelangelo. I wasn't studiously checking back and forth. I was stopping the reference and finding a rhythm within those muscles. And that's Frank. That's Frank right there. Even with this long head of the tricep stops right there because I know it attaches onto a process bone there. And then we've got the terrace major and then the trapezius coming down here. And knowing all that anatomy means we can riff off of it. And that's what I love about Frank is he really knew it or he couldn't have riffed off of it. You can't do it unless you know it so well that you can change it. And that's what I, that's what I learned from Frank there. And putting on costumes. Gorgeous. Thank you, sir. And even just putting in bangles like this, I have to now wrinkle that flesh. So you see a lot of bad art where you put a bangle on and it's just floating there on the arm. So knowing that I had to make that choice, and here as well, this was a nude model, that I had to push in. I had to pressure into the flesh here, pressure into the flesh, and then reverberate it to coincide with not just that pressure, but the ripple effect all the way through. That's what I learned from Frank. And you see it's oils. I just love oils. And here you can see it's quite ordinary academic to begin with, starting to just put those muscles in blocky style and then change them slowly as I go through it. There's the rhythms of it. That's what I was thinking, the rhythms. But I was coming down here to find something. <laughs> so I'll go off on a tangent. There was a reason, I know it's gonna pop up and I'll go, there's the reason, the name of that painting. That's what it was. Oh, yes, yes. I had forgotten too. I was like, oh, I was having so yeah. much fun. I, I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> and here's what I, what I still have to learn from Frank right here, Sarah. When to stop. I mean, that painting, that doesn't need much more in there. And I just over glossed it. It didn't need much more. And if I come down here, the atmosphere I have in the background there is better than the atmosphere I end up with. I still love the final painting, just like I love both versions of Frank's um, paintings where he redid them. But it's not getting any better in that background with more color. It's just getting more bombastic. But, you know, I enjoy every moment of it, the water going down the steps. Still abstract when you look up close and mm -hmm. and learn to look at the world. This is where Frank really astounds me, is that I've been all over the world. I've been in Wadi Ram, I've been everywhere. I, I have experienced Egypt. I know what it's like when it gets dark there. It's different than when it gets dark here in Australia. It's different when it gets dark in Pennsylvania. And yet Frank painted that darkness as if he'd gone to Egypt. It was incredible. So I know what light looks like when I'm in the, you know, the Jordan Valley or something. And so these abstract shapes are simple for me because I'm drawing on that experience. And Frank, it still astounds me that he didn't travel and yet he was able to pull that out. Still gonna he get- He said that. it might've been past lives. <laughs> he goes, That's maybe I have past like. lives, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think he might, might be onto something there. I'm like, perhaps. That's what perhaps. it <laughs> Well, I was thinking, Sarah, what, how quickly you picked up the, your art, I, how quickly that happened, so fast. And part of me was looking into neuroscience. Is a gene really a thing? I mean, a terrible thing happened in the America. I'll just do it quickly. They separated identical twins at birth. There's a documentary about it. It's really awful. Mm -hmm. They separated them at birth and they give them to different parents and they give them deliberately to a poor parent and a rich parent. And they wanted to see if they became um, the genes of their parents or whether they became the environmental uh, result of where they lived, whether they, they would, was there actually a spark inside their DNA that made them their parents' children? Or are they just another set of new creatures that go and become something because of their environment? It was astonishing. And but when I look at your work, I'm going, that is very fast. That is a very fast 
move forward in, in technique is that spark, is the gene in there? Have you, are you Frank Frazetta inside? I, I'm thinking, I'm gonna look into that a little bit more because the neuroscience yeah. is longer all the time. I it, it is, it's, yeah, there's, I, I think, because science always goes back and forth on the nature and nurture argument. And I do, I, I think there's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's definitely, there's definitely gene coding in, in my opinion. And, and as, as much as, you know, it's like the old saying, we, we inevitably turn into our parents and, yeah. and that's even, it will even being like estranged or really trying not to by, by your own, um, you know, way of, of, of nurturing yourself at a certain point, but then there's just still some things like I, I, I always bring up my heritage of being a half Irish, half Sicilian, because I think there's a lot that's passed on through for, through generations of, of certain behaviors. And it's not just like, you know, three generations removed, it goes all the way back. And then when you keep going back and you, you know, go down a rabbit hole with this, like we're, we're all connected, we're all family, we all come from the same genes. So it's, it's, but, but it's, it's a very, it is very interesting. I, um, and thank you for saying that about my, my pace of picking it up. And I mean, I, I still, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'll never feel adequate since I'm my grandfather's, you know, granddaughter. And I'm, 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 but I, I don't, someone's asked me that before. It was a, of another artist. He goes, it must be very like intimidating, like living in the shadow. And I said, not at all, especially because when I'm, when I'm drawing, it's, it is my hobby. It's just something fun for me to do. And I, I enjoy it. And how I fell upon it was a very like kind of mysterious, um, had a mystique element to it in its, in its own self. And so, and I always, I kind of always felt like this is going to like the spirit world, but I always felt like my grandpa was is around me at certain times when I'm picking up the pencil and I have like that energy going through. Um, even like the way I'll like hold a pencil or my mom said the other day for the first time, she goes, you know, I see a lot. She goes, I see your style. Um, I, I see it in a, it kind of looks similar to when your grandpa just started when he was like 12, yeah. which to me, that's still a compliment because I'm like, great. Because he was, <laughs> I thought he was a genius when he was 12. So that's great. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I just think there's like a certain, we, we pass down in genes, like a certain, again, it's like an, it's energy. And, um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get intimidated by it at all. I just think, I think my grandpa really did want us all to, to, to create and whatever that meant for each one of us. Um, everyone has different skills and, and, and art's fun. Um, when, when I feel like doing it sometimes I don't know if you get this Patrick but like not to complain about like health stuff but like my arm my my scapula I need to learn more about anatomy so I can like strengthen there has strengthened the pectoral muscles to support the scapula because when I'm constantly looking down and my trap is tightening then yeah. I get this like radiating pain down my arm and I'm like all right so I'm trying to to my grandpa god bless him he never had that problem because he was so damn athletic all of his muscles were you know, perfectly um, defined. So he had all the support in his system, but I, 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 however, do not. So that's been a challenge. So when I, when I'm not hurting and my right arm's not radiating nerve pain, I love drawing. It's a great time. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you should say that, Sarah, because I had that from students too. And there must be micro muscles that we work because, you know, when I was teaching gestural um, drawing, I had a lot mm -hmm. of students go like this, uh -huh, you know, and it is one of the hardest things is to lift any weight at all at arms mm -hmm. length, up to the shoulder length. You can just put a couple of bags of sugar there and you'll start to, to fall. I think there's just that after a while, if you do it, you know, a couple of minutes every day or a couple of hours, you no longer feel it. Like my dad, for instance, he was a plasterer. And so mm -hmm. imagine what he was doing. Hawk and trial lifting up what would have been a bag of potatoes and pushing it on the wall and then turning it and turning it imagine what that was like and you could see his muscles you could touch his shoulder and it was like a rock so i think it's just a matter of you know a little bit maybe a little exercise of just lifting small weight up and then after a while you start to not feel it so i always thought i remember a student holding his hand up like that and he, he did that i says what are you doing he says i'm tired i'm tired <laughs> you're supporting this arm with that arm 
I wonder if it's because we're all like this all the time. So our thumbs are incredibly strong. And then our, you know, yeah, yeah. The, my thumbs, I mean, geez, they can just go yeah. forever because it's what I've been yeah. trained to do. But you're and, you're right. Just do a little yeah. bit of motions every day yeah. to train that brain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's those pollutants. Really strong. What are these muscles? They're pollicis muscles. You got two here and then you got another two in here. And so oh, they're these are they're very strong. The they're, they're jacked right now. I mean, yeah, I'm totally, this is ready for a competition here with the thumb yeah. muscle. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, that's your, thin, that's your thenar eminence. What's scary is that, that um, apes have them on their feet as well. <laughs> they were going to hold them. That is scary. I'm, I'm glad. We, so we don't, we don't have that. That's good. No, that's... you don't have them in, not in your feet. <laughs> I was going to say something. Yeah. I kind of wish we had that. That'd be fun to be able to grab people with our yeah. feet. <laughs> it could be or push people away. Yeah. Now, back to this, Sarah. So mine was stolen. How the hell was that stolen from the museum wall with all that sensory stuff? Because I'll tell you a funny story. Sorry, before I do. You know how I brought my wife and I says, look, this is going to be an all day affair. So prepare yourself for it. And you mm -hmm. know, Pennsylvania. There's nothing there for her to go shopping. I mean, she no, there's no shop. I was gonna when you go said to, shopping, I'm like, where? Yeah. She go to the costume, <laughs> go to the costume store or go That's down the true. road to that. There was a lovely little Italian restaurant down the street, by the way, that I went to. And they were it was delicious. So I'm sure Frank must have gone in there often. I'm trying to think. Yeah. I'm trying it's to think just the tiniest, the name? No, it was, it's so many years ago. This was two, 2016. But there was just it was just a little sort of picket fence, I think, next to it. You know, I, I can't remember. It's this. Maybe I'm conjuring up the picket fence, but it felt very like a um, a family um, business rather than you know where he went. He went to China Buffet, and it's not glamorous. Like he he went to the he loved China Buffet. Oh, did he really? Little, yeah, it was. We went there too often. I'm like, oh, I wonder. I have so many problems and eating really bad food for a very long time. But uh, yeah, he loved it. He liked. Um, the lobster sauce. I'm getting grossed out saying this. He liked the <laughs> any, any of like the, the seafood dishes, and I don't know what you know what kind of quality seafood they were getting in there. Probably not great, but um, no, he would just he loved it. So yeah, love there, weren't, there weren't a whole lot of options there at all. There's, I I, think they're, there's, they're getting better that area. It's yeah. getting a bit. Well, I love Chinese food too, so I can say me and Frank are the same. But I have to come down to, to um, uh, what is it, Boca Grande? Is that where you Boca, are? Bo Boca Grande, we call it Boca Grande, but properly Boca Grande. Oh, is it Grande? Means, I was going to ask. I was going to ask. Yeah, it means, it means big mouth in Spanish um, <laughs> because of the pass. And then the, it's it's really the name of the pass. So how the, how the, uh, bo the, the waterways are, are curved. But yeah, yeah it, was, it was Boca Grande was his, I mean, that was his, that was the place he wanted to, to grow old. And it was, it's such a magical little island. We'd love to have you. Yeah. So, if, I mean, that's quite the journey, but you say you yeah. travel. So I'm sure you can handle that flight. For me, I'm again, acting like my grandpa. I'm like, oh, I want to travel, but yeah. I just don't know if I can handle the flights. It's like very intimidating. Oh, they are tough. They are tough. You have to yeah. get your mind, you have to get your mind right. And I'm starting to get, I'm not a tall guy, but I want that long leg room now. And I'm, I'm upgrading, not the business class, just a long, you can get long leg room. And I thought, yeah. oh yeah, I'm going to get that long leg room. And I got in there and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. And there was a guy sitting there with his bare feet on and his feet smelt and he was sitting right there. Oh. And it was the worst trip ever. It was, oh. he was wiggling his toes. You gotta his say at that point, put your shoes on. I'm not, I, this is ridiculous. <laughs> that long leg room. Make him feel uncomfortable. That's, that's yeah. unacceptable. <laughs> it's horrible. Oh. Yeah, but what I do is I break it up. I, I go to um, I go to Vancouver or up to Canada to see my friends up there. And then I break the trip up and then take the flight down to Los Angeles or to New York. But one of those two that's things good. I'll do. And this I'm, I'm in Los Angeles two months from now. I'm going to the New Masters Academy to, to uh, record stuff. And then I'm going to be oh, in, wow. in Warsaw in um in March to see our friends, Man Mind Work Games. Let's give them a shout out. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. I cannot forget Mateo and Alex. And oh, oh they're my wonderful. God, what a, oh they're my so God, funny. what an incredible job they did on, yeah. on your artwork. They're brilliant. Um, my, and, and the living legend piece that Alex did of my grandfather's yeah. and the A1 and, and first the Nazgul Lord. I mean, wow. Like they, and the, the scale, it's it's just incredible. So yes, that's, that's going to be so much fun. I- Oh, Maybe one people. day when you visit them, I'll join you because I've oh, done, yeah. we, I've been meaning to get over there. I I, I need to do that. It's just going to yeah. be my conquering my fear of uh, of a ten hour flight. But yeah, yeah. it's not that bad. Oh, it's worth it. 
Yeah, there's so much fun too. And Alex that you're talking about there, he's, he's quite, he's like Frank, he's like a real confident, you know, in his youth, real confident guy that's so great at what he does. And they're so, um, they're so open to learning things, you know, that the, their sense of wonder is, is fantastic. And, you know, I can't speak Italian, I'm, I'm learning a little bit. Uh, so they're having to translate. And, and he's walking around, We've, we're good friends now, me and Alex. And he's walking around. I see you're a bit of a cock of the walk there, aren't you, Alex? And it's a term in, in England, the cock of the walk. Have you heard of it, Sarah? Cock of the I, walk? I kind of like I'm figuring out what it means just by the, the context. But yeah. tell me, tell me it's, the exact meaning of. It's really old English. It's it's basically uh -huh. someone that walks like a cockerel. And so the cockerel is the boss of the of the, the chicken pen. Right. And they walk. Right. Right. They, they walk like that. That's what I was thinking, like a rooster. He's the, yeah. he's the cock. He's like a he's very, rooster, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes he's, sense. I like yeah. that. He says, <laughs> I'm going to use that. He says, what is this cock of the walk? I says, you know, like you walk like you're, you know, you're the head rooster. He says, the cock. <laughs> I'm the cock of the walk? I says, yeah, the cock of the walk. I'm the cock of the walk. And he's walking around like this. <laughs> Everyone's going, what are you doing? He says, I'm the cock of the walk. And he was it was their great fun they're really great fun with his italian accent i love yeah. the way the italians speak there's just so much there's and yeah. and, and they're like they must be some, saying something not to say they're not saying something important but <laughs> if there's so much emphasis on every single word and it's like wow like yeah. it's just, it's i know a, it's brilliant there's a lot of theatrics and drama into the yeah. culture <laughs> well alex alex is actually spanish but he was he is was, he yeah he was oh, talking about the same he was same. talking italian the whole time latin same thing <laughs> yeah oh they're so similar now sarah where is it what's your what's your your take on it? if you want to ask uh well place. i would also like to put out a, a missing notification like you did if anyone would like to return pain on the golden sea you can um yeah we would offer a reward as well we we don't know this is a very big mystery um, I can't even tell uh -huh. you the year, exact year that it went missing. Maybe you know. But, but not, um, well, I didn't know it was missing, Sarah, until you said. So it was missing after 2016. In fact, it was missing. Yeah. Yeah, it was missing after. It was missing, in, but it was missing um, after my grandma passed away. So in yeah. 2009. And yeah. we don't know where it is. And I would love to. There's been a, quite a few people that have kind of uh, just popped up and said, hey, so Pain on the Golden Sea. Should you open up an investigation? What's going on? And and you know we're 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 thinking about doing something. Um, yeah. and I hope hopefully they. I mean they FBI is worldwide. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> sorry, I have to re I had to rethink there. My brain cogs aren't working. It wasn't then. It was two thousand and eight when I was at the museum. That's how long ago it was when I was talking to. But Ellie. you read. Did you, but you visited again, right? Yes, so I that did. Maybe the, I did. Yeah, so that's but it was right. 2008 when I saw it. 2008 was the last time I saw this. I, I, I knew what you meant, even without yeah. saying, because I knew that you had visited twice. So I was, because yeah. uh, I knew my grant when she passed away. Yeah. So you yeah. saw in 2008. Yeah. So it, yes. went, it went missing a, a year after. And we oh. do not know the whereabouts of Cain on the Golden Sea, but oh my God. <laughs> we can talk about a reward if you find it, anyone. Um, Please. Such, such a great painting let's have a look yeah. at it let's have a look at what makes it so great for me i think is look at how they're all they're all looking into this distance he's not he's not giving us a profile frank isn't doing that he's giving us that look at that and just every one of them all heading in that direction i love this guy here it shows a little bit of, yeah. influence, I think, from the Brandywine artists. If you don't know the Brandywine artists, they're just brilliant. And there was one called Shunover and another one called N.C. Wyeth. And they're at the Brandywine Museum, if you get a chance. And Hedrick, did, did you steal the painting? <laughs> that's my that's my son again. He's a cheeky, <laughs> he's a cheeky one. Patrick? No, that would have been a you cheeky bring this one, up because it? it's in your collection? <laughs> that would have been a cheeky <laughs> move, wouldn't it? Did you get that painting? <laughs> just get an empty tube. Oh, that's strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a wish. Well, that would be clever. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but once again, look at the anatomy from Frank. And here's where he's riff, really riffing. See this little moment here? This is a bunch of things. That's the um what we commonly know as the Ulma, but it has a had a little cap on it called the Alecranon. I al always love the name of that. But what's really ringing out here is this anconius move right here. This is called an anconius muscle, and it basically attaches right on to the smallest edge. The bone continues on down here. The small, smallest edge of the upper bone. 
So it's come and on here to attach from the humerus bone. It's come and on to attach and all of these muscles coming off of it, radio radialis group going up above that. And then the spread knot like a towel is just sensational. And if he didn't have photographic reference for this, once again, that's impossible. That is so brilliant. And I don't think he did have photographic reference because he's rifted so much. He's done this and given us way more than we could possibly expect and gnarled it up as well. Look at that tricep coming right up there. All of this stuff that he did, so seemingly effortless and that brachialis pulling through. A lot of artists won't know this muscle at all, but Frank knew it. And it was a sign for me, you know, and this short head of the bicep, look how Frank wears it off, you know, an amateur would do that, do a bigger bicep by making it a balloon. And Frank didn't, he squared it off. I think that's where the Bridgman memory came in for Frank. But boy, did he push it even more to find those solidness and then those curves, you know, that, that run all the way up to that acromion process there. Just flatten it right off. Just that one moment right there in that painting is a, a lifetime of an anatomical study done effortlessly, done absolutely what looks to me effortless. And there's the divide between the extensors on this side and the flexors on that side. And I often, when I'm painting, try to get all of this into my work with that kind of confidence. And he just did it so simply. And I love the way he gesturally pushed that finger out at the end to complete that entire cycle all the way up. Just astonishing. Now, artists that haven't studied so much would probably say, well, you know, that just... you." Patrick, you just traced over the top of something and said that's the way it was. I know. I, I'm, I'm going to put it out there. I know that he was thinking that the whole time. There's no way all that beauty can come from an accident after an accident, after a, a bit of luck and another bit of luck. It's impossible. All of that is deliberate. And I would love to have sat with Frank and discussed that because I would believe he would be nodding the whole time and then add to it, I'm sure, and say, yeah, but did you notice the great trochanter peeking in there, Patrick? And this is what I, this is my dream, sitting down with Frank. Did you see how I cried, that I flattened off the edge here, the biceps be more before I brought it in? Yeah, I did, I did, Frank. This is my dream of what the conversation would be like. But that's what I love about it. Is I, I can take any portion of this and see new stuff all the time. Just astonishing. And that's the first time I've looked at that and dissected it. And wow, it's just always that was, there. That was incredible. So yeah, this is an early one. I think this is called The Farthest Star, Beyond the Farthest yes. Star. And I think right here, know how we, you are now, Sarah, we are discovering the art. And then there's so much more to come. I think this was the moment where Frank was taking a leap into another dimension. Right here at this point, beautiful work. It really is. And I think he even said he liked the soupy nature of it. But this one here, I, it's just, even back then when everybody was on fire and Frank was just finding his feet, I would have went, this is, a, this is somebody special. Something incredible is happening here. And I can't wait to see what comes next. And this was the moment. And I think this is a watercolor and it's painted, yes. like, like, painted like it's an oils. He didn't start uh, painting with oils till he was turned 31. I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing, too. Now, it's watercolors. I'm like, how did you do that? Because you don't get to go back on watercolors and, and yeah. take everything, anything off like you do with oil. Oil is very graceful in that way, but not yeah. watercolor. Watercolor, it's, it's done. It's ruined or it's perfect. Yeah. And he just, with his watercolors, his watercolor that really is, is incredible to me is um, this, the secret people. Uh, that yeah. one is just oh, yeah. phenomenal. The Ray and, Bradbury. And of course, yeah. Yes, yes, and his um, his um, uh, Golden Girl. That's that's probably at the top of my list of of my all time favorite Frazettas. This is Golden Girl, yeah. and that was done in the fifties, and that's just incredible in every in every sense of the word. Yeah, I agree. Well, I agree on everything, and I I love them all, every single one. And yeah, we were talking about this not getting enough love. I mean, look at that, look at this saber tooth guy here. Just brilliant at everything. It's a wonderful business. But look at that lovely burr right there of golden light just on the hip. Look at that. Just a sensation. 
And you can really see the thinness of the oils here. Look at that, just shaking those oils down and just letting it go. This is what I need to do. I am experimenting right now, but I want to paint like Frank showed me there. And so I'm experimenting with this kind of stuff. Do you see that? Where I just don't want to stop. And so I'm doing, you can see it in the legs here. I'm feeling what Frank has. I'm now re um, learning again from Frank how to be loose. So I've learned all this stuff and now I'm going back in again. And that's what makes Frank Frazetta a cut above the rest. As I've been growing as an artist, artists that were impressive to me have very slowly faded away. And some of them, when I look at it, I go, what was I even thinking? That's awful, that work that I used to think was terrific. Frank is one of only a, a handful of artists, and we include Schoonover, N.C. Wyeth, those guys from that golden era, that I could say I get more impressed with his art as I grow older. Not less, more. I am more in awe of him the more I know, instead of being less impressed with the more I know. That's what's astonishing about Frank Frazetta. So I'm doing this now. I'm starting to feel that rhythm. And I give myself um, six hours. I said, six hours, and you better have that done. So no stopping for procrastination or any change at all. And I painted first two sets of three hours. I just went like that. And that was it done. And no more. And I want more of that. I want to be able to say, I can paint a picture in a day like Frank Frazetta. But it's going to be that loose that loose it's, it's beautiful I love the looseness of that it's gorgeous and it is like music there's so much rhythm to it and that's 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 beautiful I love all of your work so you know I, I the details like you said the fleshiness I feel like I can go in and like you know pinch her back like I could touch her like she's she's real yeah and I, that's just it's just incredible really this has been so inspiring like really really truly I uh, I'm definitely going to buy all of your books because I, I now I'm, I, I want to learn from you. I love the way, so this is one thing my grandpa was not, he was not a teacher. He could not teach art at all. Yeah. Um, he would just, he would just say to people, just, just do this. And then he'd end up doing the piece or the face or, and, but he, cause he was, he was an awful, he was an awful teacher. He, my mom tried to get some <laughs> lessons from him. I, I believe at as it Frank Jr. Um, they didn't work out because he just, he, some, a couple of people have asked, they're like, well, have you, did he ever give lessons? And, and at that time, you know, he was struggling with his health problems. But prior to that with his kids, he, they just, they said he was the worst. And they were like, what are you yeah. saying? Like, you're not, you're not helping at us at all. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty incredible that you can intellectualize all of this and then then give this advice to, to new artists and, and established artists. It's really, really incredible what you're doing. So thank, thank you for doing that. And I'm so glad that you started this show so we can yeah. all be inspired and learn so much from it. It's, it's truly incredible. My first guest. What a marvel oh, my guest you've been. What, how, it's just how been great. so wonderful. I will treasure this for so long, this experience yes. with you. And I really do. I, I hope I meet you in person. I, I know we will. Like we'll, yeah. we will cross paths soon and at some point. It's certain to. Totally on hey, Patrick, I have to say really quickly, I love how yeah. you say your name. But I like when, when will the Irish, like little, the, how the Irish names sound when it's spoken in, in oh. its true form and That's it's an accent. Like, like with, with the, the Banshee of the Irna Sharam movie, yeah. um, when they said Colin, like it's so oh, much yeah. better than Colin, like as, how, as Americans, we say Colin and it's like Colin. And I'm like, that's, and then you say Patrick and it's like pa Patrick, you almost think like a Patrick and it just yeah. sounds very nice. Like I, I want to say Patrick instead of Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant that's really good i think you could uh, think, i think if you went to ireland you'd be speaking like that in no time oh no, I, I well yeah that would yeah. Like, they'd, they'd be like this girl's insane it's like you know yeah. remember johnny depp he he took the accent um from living over in, in the uk for a while and yeah. he's actually from kentucky so everyone thought he was from there but he's like no i just yeah. you know i'm an actor i pick up on things quickly yeah. more than most <laughs> well, there's a sing song to it it's just it basically just practice this it's just that but hey, 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 just that. Okay. Yeah. You can even just do that because sometimes if you go to somewhere like Cork, all you'll hear is this. All right, sure, buddy. How do you have a beer? Yeah. Yeah, just this. walk around saying cheers. That's all I'd say to everyone in Ireland. <laughs> yeah, slauncha. There's a bit of Irish. Slauncha. What's uh, that? That's Gaelic for cheers. Slauncha. Okay. Slauncha. Uh, 
All right, yeah. Sarah, I will wrap it up. Now, we probably do two goodbyes here because I have to goodbye you on Zoom as well. So I'm going to goodbye. Yes. How am I going to get out? I'm, see, once you're in Zoom, you can't get out. It's like you have to be a mime. I don't know how to get out of here. So I'm going to say goodbye to the- I uh, don't either. <laughs> so I can't help you. <laughs> I'm, I'm useless now. Patrick. Say Patrick. <laughs> Patrick. Patrick. <laughs> Patrick. That's, that's, that's how you say Patrick and Patrick's in trouble. Patrick, come here. That's how. Oh. I, that's my mom. Adric. Hi. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say goodbye to the stream people now. If you want to wave to them, Sarah. And all the information is down below. Thank you. I'm going to end that and then I'm going to end uh, Zoom with us. So it's going to be just us in a second, Sarah. Thanks for okay. everybody that came in and for being, uh, and for Sarah for being the greatest guest on the first podcast. That